week and, and launch out into the deep. <laughs> I hope we keep our head above the water. Father, I pray that you give me wisdom, you give me the gift of teaching, open the hearts of the people to receive your word and receive the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, turn Galatians 1 with me this morning. And we're going to go back to uh, the Apostle's statement in verse number 14. And quickly move along through this. I've got so much ground I want to cover, and I don't get bogged down because there's some stuff I definitely want to at least get introduced this morning if we don't get much time in it. Uh, Galatians 1.14, the Apostle Paul said that I have profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. <clears throat> So the Apostle Paul clearly delineates a difference between uh, just an Israelite and the Jews' religion. And the reason he does that is because the Jews' religion is an outgrowth of, uh, it is an evolutionary process of uh, incorporating Babylonian religion into the, into the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And remember I told you that two laws were given at Sinai. Now this of course is according to rabbinic tradition, two laws. The law written in stone, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, and the oral law. And with them the oral law takes precedence over the written law. Why? Because the oral law can be transmitted and understood and controlled, whereas the written law is an entirely different thing. Once it's written down and disseminated into the hands of the people, it's an entirely different thing. So the oral law became the basis for what's known today as the Babylonian Talmud. A Jew does not reject the Lord Jesus Christ based on the Old Testament. If all you have, in the, if the only thing separating a Jew from faith in Christ is you taking him through the Old Testament, you can get him saved. But he, is not, uh, he does not reject the Lord Jesus based on the Old Testament. He rejects him based on the Talmud. The Talmud is a is a uh, it's made up of uh, the Midrash, the Mishnah, and the Gemara, and these basic fundamental divisions that uh, constitute the Talmud uh, is it was developed over centuries of time. It's not something that happened overnight. Uh, you've got to keep in mind that the Jews at Sinai, 1,400 years before Christ, received the law at Sinai from God. Before that, they had passed down from generation to generation their knowledge of history. For example, when they were carried off back into uh, uh, the time of Abraham and Jacob went down into Egypt because of a famine, uh, they spent 400 years in Egypt and came out after 400 years. Well, now Abraham is 2000 B.C., so the Jews had a knowledge of that all the way back to 2000 B.C. And so when Moses wrote the Pentateuch, the book of Genesis, he wrote all the way back to the very beginning of mankind on this earth. So where did he get it? He got it from God. Who did God give it to? He gave it to the Jew. He gave it to the Jew who has the oracles of God. So in any event, the uh, Babylonian Talmud is the issue. It's the sticker that keeps a Jew from being saved. Because the Babylonian Talmud, as I've told you before, time and time and time again, presents the Lord Jesus Christ in a codified manner. And the reason for that is because down through the ages with Christian monarchs, the Jews were able to communicate with each other through the Talmud and discern it their, their, with uh, their own way. It's like the quatrains of uh, Nostradamus. When Nostradamus, Nostradamus wrote his quatrains, or he, you know, he's called a prognosticator of prophet, I don't believe it, but they call him that. Uh, he was living in the times of the Inquisition when they could have burned him at the stake. And so he, he couched his quatrains in codified terminology. And you had to know the secrets, you had to be enlightened, you had to know what was going on in order to interpret that, see? And he could say, well, that's not what it means if they brought him on charges of heresy or something like that. So the Babylonian Talmud is, is a book that is, uh, is definitely couched in, uh, in uh, a, a terminology like that, that only the elite or the enlightened ones understand. And therefore, they teach their children. It's very important that they teach their children from generation to generation. We turn our kids over to the world. 
and let them teach them, and we pay a dear price for it. The Pope is urging a legitimate redistribution of wealth. Now, who does that sound like? Heard that from anybody lately? Uh, and uh, this is not. Uh, this is this is very recent. Uh, here's another little tidbit. Imagine one Sunday morning you go to your local Christian church and find that something very odd's going on. As you approach the church building, a stranger wearing a gay pride T-shirt opens the door for you and says, "Come in. God loves you just the way you are." Confused, you hurry to the worship service, find that a New Age guru has been invited to preach. After the error-filled sermon, you stagger to your Sunday school class and hear the shocking claim that Christ is not the only way to heaven, but that eternal life can be found in all religions. You are then asked to seek a spirit guide to verify this truth through Eastern meditation. And on and on it goes. A school is scorched for having kids bow to the sun god. And here sits a boy in the lotus position. And you may think that the lotus position, of course, what does this relate to? What's the lotus position? Yoga. Yoga. And you may think that it's, uh, you know, it's just an innocent thing. But the fact of the matter is, this is a form that they take to offer up sacrifices to their gods, which are in the millions. And yoga itself means to be yoked. So uh, what we have now is the school system is, uh, having, is, is, has been scorched. Someone raised a voice because of it for having kids bow down to the sun god. And of course, Akhenaten, who was the, one of the, uh, of the pharaohs of Egypt, introduced the worship of the sun and, uh, in his own manner. And you can see where they, uh, where they have the disc down there in Egypt and he worshiped the sun. And then after Akhenaten died, they went in there and they hacked his picture, his relief, you know, uh, off, of the, off of the monuments. And they used those stones to build more monuments to later pharaohs, uh, completely doing away with the religion of Akhenaten. We don't worship the sun god. We worship the one who made the sun. The sun of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, the Bible says. There's a vast difference between the creature and the creator. There's an insurmountable gulf that separates the two. There is no way the creature will ever become the creator. There's only one creator who is God blessed forever. Amen. The creature will never rise to that position of creator. And there's just one. So we find when we get into this that, uh, that the road begins to develop. Now, I told you last week that the first man the Bible called a Jew was who? First man, first individual in the Bible called a Jew. Mordecai is found in the book of Esther, chapter number 2, verse 5. Here's what British Israelism tries to do. They try to say that Jew is a term that relates to religion and religion only, which it does not. It relates to a religion, but it also relates to an ethnicity. But they try to teach that Jew, if the term Jew shows up, it refers only to the two tribes, the southern tribes of Benjamin and Judah. The reason they do that is because they have an agenda that, evolve, that involves the ten northern tribes. And that's called British Israelism. And British Israelism is, in, is entrenched, believe me. It is a very powerful uh, interpretation of religion. And we're going to deal with some of that this morning and hopefully... Uh, by the grace of God, it'll, it'll begin to uh, help us to understand some things. The Bible said Mordecai was called a Jew. Paul's called a Jew. Peter's called a Jew, Galatians 2.14. And Peter was, uh, was from uh, Galilee, Matthew chapter number 4. He was, a, he was from, the north, from the north. All right, now why is that important? Well, being of the ten tribes, one of the ten tribes of the north, still called a Jew. See the connection? Makes a big difference. They say that ten tribes are lost, but Anna was of the tribe of what? Anna the prophetess. You remember Simeon and Anna, the two showed up when Christ was brought to the temple. Anna was of the tribe of Asher. So the idea that you have ten lost tribes is a fabrication. It's a, it's a very controversial thing. But <laughs> you need to keep in mind, there's a lot going on when people talk about British Israelism. I'm going to get into some of that this morning. John 4, 22, the Lord Jesus told the woman at the well, he said, salvation is of the Israelites. 
Didn't sound right, did it? What does it say? It's of the Jews. 1 Corinthians in chapter number 10 verse 32 says that we have a division of Jew, Gentile, and Church of God. And the Bible says in Galatians 3.28, in Christ neither Jew nor Gentile have any identity whatsoever. Racial identity, ethnic identity, uh, whatever else is lost in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ there is only one identity and that is of a born again believer. That's important to understand because British Israelism has some, uh, is a pretty powerful thing uh, controlling the lives of a lot of people. Now just exactly what is it? They make a clear distinction between the two southern tribes of Benjamin and Judah and the ten northern tribes that were supposed to have been lost during the, during the Assyrian captivity of 722 B.C. The chosen people of God are the Celtic Anglo-Saxons, according to them. Isaac's sons became Saxons, according to, according to British Israelism. Bereth is covenant in Hebrew, which is true. Ish is man in Hebrew, which is true. Hence, Brit Ish is man of the covenant. <laughs> See how you can manipulate words? <laughs> Where did that come from? That's where it came from. Britannia equals covenant ship. The throne of David is in Great Britain. Now remember folks, this is not what I believe. I'm laying the foundation for British Israelism. The throne of David is in Great Britain. It was brought to Ireland by Jeremiah Baruch and T. Teffy. Great Britain is the crushing stone of Daniel chapter number 2 verse 35. Represented by the big stone in the pyramid, Isaiah chapter number 19, verse 19. The little stone is the coronation stone in Westminster Abbey. The coronation stone is the throne of God. It is called Leith Fael, wonderful stone. It is supposed to be Jacob's pillow from the book of Genesis chapter number 28, verse 11, brought to Ireland by Jeremiah. Now that's a mouthful. Here's a picture of the coronation stone. It's hard for you to see, I'm sure. But the coronation stone sits underneath a throne. This, uh, this adherent to British Israelism has a website, and here's what he says. The coronation stone which sat in Westminster Abbey, England, is the coronation stone of the Hebrew nation called Israelites. This stone was named Beth El, House of God, by the patriarch Israel, sometimes called Jacob, roughly 2000 B.C., and remained with his descendants. It traveled with them for 40 years in the wilderness, supplying their water, and was preserved and brought to Ireland 583 B.C. by the prophet Jeremiah, eventually being transferred to Scotland, then England, and now resides in Scotland. The coronation stone, the coronation chair rather of England has been in constant use to crown the monarchs of England since 1296 AD when Edward I had it constructed for his coronation. The chair was built specifically to house the coronation stone which Edward brought from Scotland. It had resided there since being brought from Fergus from brought by Fergus from Ireland 500 AD. Its earliest use as a coronation stone in Ireland was 583 B.C. when Echidid, I don't know how to pronounce that, the Heremon was crowned High King of Ireland after his marriage to T. Tephi, the daughter of Zechariah, Zedekiah rather, the King of Judah, conquered by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. Now here with all these statements, these historical statements, all right? You got all of this stuff about a stone coming, all this and that and so forth and so on. Footnotes, references historical references, authority for all of this. <laughs> Footnotes are important. References are very important. Why? Because you're going to find out the source of the thing. And uh, either that or it's plagiarism. Plagiarism is when you take credit for the authority of it and uh, you know you write an essay and you quote somebody but use their quote as if it's your quote and uh, that's plagiarism. And that's a no-no. <laughs> 
if they catch you and they, if you go to a college or somewhere and they, they catch you in plagiarism, you know what they do? They throw your work out. It's finished. You don't get any credit for it whatsoever. But in any event, all of this continues on about how that the stone was carried to England and the stone sits under this chair. And I know you can't see it either. It's so small. But here's the chair that the kings were coronated on. The coronation took place, kings and queens. And the stone is underneath that. So it is the stone of Jacob from the book of Genesis. And therefore a direct connection is made between the monarchy in England and Jacob and the ten tribes. And they go into great detail to make the connection between the two. Historical authority. Once again, there is no historical. They quote each other. <laughs> is that an authority? One Jehovah's Witness quotes another Jehovah's Witness as if that's an authority. That's no authority. But the bottom line is that British Israelism gave birth to a lot of things. There's a lot of stuff going on today that's a direct product of it. For example, British Israelism has its own eschatology. It has its own, uh, it has its, in other, in other words, it has its own worldview. Here's what one British Israelite says. Now, I'm going to be honest and fair with British Israelism, and I'm going to tell you that this is what one says. It does not necessarily represent the foundational belief of all of them, but here's also the problem with that stuff. Just exactly what do they believe? Somebody said, what do the Jews believe? Which Jew? Which group of Jews? What do Christians believe? Which Christian? So forth and so on. So uh, here's, what, uh, here's what one British Israelite said. Christianity is regarded as a false religion. British Israelism rejects Christianity because of the following reasons. Number one, it does not uphold and observe all the laws of Yahweh. Who's Yahweh? I don't have a clue, but I know who Jehovah is. Amen. Number two, it does not use the covenant name of Yahweh as well as the correct name for the Messiah, Yahshua, Yeshua, Yahushua. Yahushua. The names God and Jesus are regarded as falsifications being derived from Greek names for idols. Jesus is said to mean son of Zeus, ye Zeus, his father being a Greek God. Now the Bible says the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. But the name Jesus is not a Hebrew name. Kind of name, what, where, what language is Jesus from? It's Greek. It's Greek. It's a Greek name. But do we throw the name Jesus out because it's a Greek name? <coughs> if that be true, we need to throw a whole lot of the New Testament out. Because it's, um, yeah, Paul, Paulus, all of this stuff. Saul of Tarsus was Paul, wasn't he? Now listen to this. It accepts, now Christianity being rejected by British Israelism, it accepts and practices the preaching of the Bible to pagans belonging to the colored races. We're going to get into that in a minute. While Yeshua himself said, do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, how do you remember what I, the context I placed that in? I told you it was a big deal. And that was before I read what this man had to say. Why did he tell them to go, in the, go not in the way of the Gentiles, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Remember the timeline that I told you was so important. <laughs> Place it on the timeline. Put it on the timeline. Late in the timeline, the Gospel of John is written, and the last chapter of Acts is written, Lo, I go to the Gentiles, and they'll hear it. But early on the timeline, the Lord Jesus took His disciples and said, Go not in the way of the Gentiles, but go into the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and preach the kingdom of what is at hand. Heaven and God are used interchangeably. Yes, they are. But they are not the same. For a while they were running concurrent with each other, but they're not the same. The kingdom of heaven was being offered to the Jewish people on this earth, a Jewish Messiah, a Jewish kingdom, with the Mount, with the Beatitudes on the Mount of Olives, or not, not the Mount of Olives, but the Mount of Beatitudes in Galilee. He preached all this, and he preached, the, he preached these message, this message to them. All of that fits perfectly on the timeline, see? But this man doesn't know anything about a timeline. What this man does is says, well now remember, Christ said 
uh, when he preached, go not in the way of the Gentiles. In plainer words, don't go to the colored people. Don't go to people of a different ethnicity. He came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now we have identified who Israel is today. Who is Israel today? See, see what's happening here? Let's watch it, watch it, watch the way it develops. You define your terms, you lay your foundation, and then you draw the people in. It's important. This is a big deal because this is the way people think. But what, I can, what I'm going to try to do with this is to show you how that it even goes higher than this fellow, a whole lot higher. That there is a, there's an agenda involved in this. And that agenda, of course, is being played out before your mind every day. It fails to reject the Apostle Paul. Now watch this. Uh, this is Christianity regarded as a false religion by this British Israelite. It fails to reject the Apostle Paul despite the fact that he broke many of the Old Testament laws. Christ broke one too. Do you remember which one he broke? On the Sabbath, the Shabbat, right? He said, the Sabbath, how did he say it was made for who? Who is it made for? So forth. What now? Uh huh. All right. Now, but anyway, listen to this. It fails to reject the Apostle Paul. Despite the fact he broke many of the Old Testament laws, he taught the people not to observe the law and also wrongfully preached the Word of God to pagans. Here we go again. See, here we go. It upholds the book of Acts written by Luke in which the evangelizing of pagans and the dishonoring of the law are promoted. Now, what is this guy? Would you consider him a Christian? Not in any sense of the word. So what is he? Well, now think about his, think about his, his eschatology, his worldview. What's he trying to say? Here's what he's trying to say. He's trying to say that only an elite group of white people make up the British Israelite foundation as he understands it. And that the biggest majority of the New Testament is to be thrown out because Paul wrote it, who misrepresented Christ in the teachings of Christ. And so therefore, as Jehudi took his pen knife and only chose, you know, cut out portions of Scripture, this man has cut out a biggest majority of the New Testament and fashioned his own theology to match his own warped mind that elevates, elevates a white man above every other race on the face of the earth. He's not original with that. We're going to get into it. He didn't start that. All he did was accommodate it. All you got to do is get something started, like the internet, and it won't be long before they put pornography on it. They accommodate it. And that's what you're dealing with here. You're dealing with somebody who has accommodated something that started long before he ever showed up. He's really, he's not original with anything. We've been through this time and time and time again about how they attacked the Apostle Paul. And now they've attacked Luke. See, there he's attacking Luke because Luke in the book of Acts, and Luke wrote Acts, is dealing with the evangelization of the pagan, as he called him. I was a pagan. Yeah. I was pagan as a pagan can be a pagan <laughs> when God saved me. Yeah. Full of paganism. <laughs> and by the grace of God and the work of the Holy Ghost, I think he's got most of it out of me. I may still have a little paganism left in me. <laughs> and <I'll, laughs> when I get on my face and cry out to God and seek the spirit of, seek, seek wisdom, and understanding from the Spirit of the Lord why He'll help me with that. Amen. Amen. But in any event, that's His brand of British Israelism. I'm not telling you this morning that all British Israelites believe that. But I'm showing you, I'm trying to show you how that you can go off on a tangent and you can get out. You can get way out there in left field. Now, the idea that colored people, which runs the gamut, I mean, you know, you've got all kinds of different colored folks. It, somehow or another are excluded from the grace of God. Where do you think that came from? How many of you have heard of Helen, Helena, Petrovna Blavatsky? All right. She founded the school of what's called Theosophy. All right. Sophy, sophist, means wisdom. A uh, philosopher is a lover of wisdom, all right? Theosophy is a conjunction of two words she created. She created the word God's wisdom, 
theos, theos, God's wisdom. Over there in Constantinople right now, if you go over, it's, uh, it's, it's Istanbul, Turkey now, you'll find a beautiful church with the womb, and it's called the Church of Hagia Sophia. That means Hagias in Greek is holy. Sophia means wisdom. So it is the church of holy wisdom. God doth know in the day you eat this fruit thereof you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Wisdom, not the wisdom of this world, not the wisdom of this world, but the wisdom which is of God, the wisdom that cometh down from, a, from God. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. All right. Wisdom that originates from a different source than from God Himself. Remember, we are driven back every time to the revelation of Scripture as to who I am, where I came from, where I'm going, and the one Redeemer of mankind. And the only source of that is the book. Now, when other things quote the book and when they quote it correctly, good for them. But that's not the source. This is the source. Uh, provenance, that's the word they use for it. Provenance means you trace a thing back to its origin. And this is it right here, the book. But wisdom, this woman claims to have wisdom. She claims to be one of the enlightened ones. She's going to teach us something. And here is her idea on the root race theory. An amazing thing how race enters into it. Do you remember somebody about uh, 60 years ago, 70 years, 1939, he went into Poland? Do you remember what his name was? He took three million troops up into, uh, into Russia. Adolf Hitler. And the terminology used in here is amazing at how close it is to what Hitler used. Now she teaches what's called the root race theory. She talks about esoteric cosmology. Esoteric is his hidden cosmology. Cosmology has to do with the structure and formation of the earth and the way we relate to it. She talks about the root race theory. She says five of these races have been revealed so far, have been manifested, have come into being. And there are a total of seven of them. So there are two races yet to come into existence. All of these races have come about by a process of evolution, according to Ms. Blavatsky. So Mr. Darwin, apparently, whether he likes it or not, is going to be pulled into this thing. Evolution. Now, Darwin was not original with evolution. Plato taught a form of evolution. And evolution has been the, uh, has been, has, has become the religion of so many people who hang a sheepskin on their wall and think they're educated. And they don't have a clue where they came from or where they're going. But in any event, five races. The first root race was the ethereal. The second root race is the Hyperborean. The third root race is the, the, the Lemur, Lemurian. The fourth, fourth root race is the Atlantean. You remember Atlantis? An advanced race of mankind. And then the fifth root race, guess what it is? Aryan. Yeah. The identical terminology that Adolf Hitler used, Helen, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky used, a Russian, and I don't know how what connection she might have had with the Russian Orthodox Church, because the Russian Orthodox Church does not teach this, so don't misunderstand me. But she was a Russian. And she, whether you know, when she made her split and made her break, you know, that's that that's that's I'm not an expert on her life. My concern is where she comes in here and begins to mess up the doctrine of Christ. My purpose in life is to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ over every piece of junk that's ever existed that pops up wherever it comes from. That's my job, and I'm going to come against it with everything I've got. So the fifth root race is the Aryan. 
Now, who's the Aryan? Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, idea about the thought of, uh, that's connected with a place called Shambhala, a place of, uh, that's connected with, with, with the ice, um, with, with the, either the North Pole or the South Pole, that it is an advanced race of people, okay? Now, here's the thing. If you use the terminology advanced race of people, what does that, what, does, what do you connect that with? Evolution, evolution. exactly. So it's all about evolution. You say, well, what big deal? You know what I mean? Here's this woman. She's been gone a long time. What's that got to do with anything? It's got to do with everything. Because she laid the foundation for what's going on today in organizations out there that are preaching their gospel and, 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 and their movement. Yes, sir. Another thing is it, it has a strong influence on modern Christianity, too. Ripley, in her book, has this material yeah. document. Yeah. The relationship between many of the people involved in perverting the word of God in the 1800s. With her? Okay. The what's, the, what's the name of the book? Hazardous Material. I'd recommend that right off the bat. Yep. That would be an outstanding work. Yes. I didn't know it existed. Yeah. That would be very good. I'll bring it to you. Okay. I won't be here this evening. Okay. That would be very good. Gail Ripplinger is one smart woman, and she loves the Lord Jesus. Amen. Make no mistake about that. Yes, sir. Are you talking about gematria, where the letter represents a, a number? Yeah. In other words, they give you the number and you take that and transfer it over to a letter, right. and it's an acronym for his name, or just, yeah. uh, just the letters of his name? Uh, okay, okay. Well, well, there's a bunch of neo Nazis in Germany. Germany's, uh, Germany has gone through one, <laughs> you know, I mean, they, it's, it's like a witch hunt over there because of their past and because of Hitler. It's, it's, uh, you just have to read. I've done a little bit of reading about it from some of their magazines, some of, the, some of what's going on in Germany. And uh, I mean, they feel that most of the Germans are definitely, they, they, they're in horror about what happened in World War II and all of that. But you've got the neo-Nazis. Neo means new, the new Nazis, the ones popped up recently. Now, uh, this work he's talking about over here that Gail Ripplinger's done is gonna make some more connections that I won't even make this morning. And she's probably done a lot of research in that, showing what he's saying is that she's showing how that this, there's a connection between uh, Blavatsky's theosophy and what's going on in the church today. Oh, you're talking, oh, okay, the German lexicon? The, the big one, uh, what's it? Uh, uh, I've, got, I've got the thing, it's about uh, uh, six or seven volumes. Yes, sir. And she connects uh, Lewis Carroll, the writer, opium using writer from the Britain there with uh, the writers, uh, the lot of translators and lexiconographers. Okay. It's a great book. <laughs> That'd be good. That'd be very good. Mm -hmm. That'd be very good. There's one thing about Gail Ripplinger. She does her homework. That's right. So when she gives you something, you just like that New Age Bible versions came out, it was way ahead of its time. I mean, it's loaded to the gills. That's one of the best things that I've ever picked up and read. And then I heard what some of the leading quote unquote Christians in the nation, some of the publishers and what have you had to say about it. One guy said, I don't have any use for that. I haven't read the stupid thing. He sounds like Pelosi, doesn't he? In reverse. Let's go ahead and vote it in and we'll find out what's in it. <laughs> he says, I haven't read the stupid thing, but I don't like it. What do you mean? That means I'm going to toe the party line that I've got my people out there listening to me and I'm not going to deviate from it one bit and this is what I believe and don't, ever, don't bother me with any facts. This is what I am. <laughs> That's what that means. I think we have copies of that book. Yeah, Do it? Okay. Good. Good. All right. So we've got Blavatsky. The Aryan is the, uh, is the fifth root race and it is the... Uh, up until this point, the most advanced of all humanity. And so now what do we get into? Now listen to this quote. But let them apostatize, and they will become gray-haired, wrinkled, and black, just like the devil. 
I like to read quotes and then let you try to figure out who said that. <coughs> Brigham Young. Yeah. How many of you know who he was? I dug a little bit into Brigham Young one time, and I don't remember exactly how many, but I think I'm pretty close on this. He had 57 wives, some of them 12, 13, 14 years old. I remember when I was in high school, they taught us about him coming out of uh, New York and leading the, the uh, tour all the way, the group all the way, after Joseph Smith died, all the way out there to uh, Utah, and uh, presented him as some, kind of a, 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 some kind of a role model, some kind of a hero, you know, the idea. But in any event, this, is the, this was the position in the Mormon church for a long time, yeah. see, that, uh, that black folks uh, were sub, uh, subpar and not to be, and don't let them, don't let them flim flam you on this right. because this is, uh, this is their leader that said, it. they'll come along and say, well, that was his opinion. The church doesn't necessarily uh, hold to that. They did for a long time. They've changed, and the reason they've changed, of course, is because of pressure, okay? Now, here's another one. First one must admit, now this is by Mason himself. This is by Mason. First one must admit that there is racism in Freemasonry. For many that is going to be hard. Racism in Freemasonry occurs in pockets around the country, but rarely in a whole jurisdiction, so forth and so on. And uh, this is only by a quick study. I got this information about what's going on with this. When I was a boy, I, have an un I had an uncle, have an uncle who was a Mason, Freemason. He was a good man. He attended church regularly. But I'll never forget, I'll never forget that uh, somebody asked him one time if they had black folks in his lodge. And he said, we don't have any black people in our lodge. Uh, they got their own lodge or something to that effect. Uh, they don't belong to us. We don't, we don't, we don't, they're not part of us. And that was quick and to the point, and I forget who asked the question, but he made it clear that as a Freemason himself and his lodge and his group, that uh, they didn't have any part with it. Now, this is not a blanket condemnation of Freemasonry. This is not a blanket com condemnation of Mormonism. I'm trying to show you how that they have in their past have had, have had issues about race. Okay. British Israelism has an issue about race. All right. Theosophy has an issue about race. Adolf Hitler had an issue about race. Connect the dots. Start connecting them. If you all have drunk from the same fountain, then you're drinking the same water. If you're, if, when you begin to trace back and look at the structure of these places, there is a connection there that goes way back. And that connection is all laid out for you by Albert Pike in his Morals and Dogma. I remember a few years ago, I had been teaching about, uh, about the uh, Masonic Lodge. And I have to admit that I was, I was young in the faith. And I had, I, had, I had learned just enough to be dangerous. <laughs> you ever been there? Just enough to be dangerous. I was on a trail, and I knew I was, but I didn't know, I, I should have known more. Because if I had that conversation with that man today, I'd have a lot more questions to ask him and a lot to say to him. But he called me up. He must have been one of the big leaders in this town that belonged to the Shriners, the lodge over there. He's not just an entry-level, low boy, third-degree Mason. This guy was way up. And he started talking to me about what I was talking about on the radio. And I quoted Albert Pike to him because I'd already studied some of Pike's writing. Here's what he said. He said, yes, Albert Pike was a Mason, but Albert Pike's views are his views. He said, every Mason is free to believe or, or reject what Albert Pike says, that when they come into the Masonic Lodge, that they all are all Masons because they make a choice to be there. All right, now I'm on, here, here's the question I would ask him. And if he's going to be honest, he's going to have to answer it. What is the one thing that brings you into the Masonic Lodge? 
that you hold in common with everybody else in that lodge. Here's the one thing that brings me into this church that I hold common with you or should. That is that the Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty and that He is the only name under heaven whereby you must be saved and there is no access to God the Father but by Him. Now, I don't know how to spell it out any plainer. It's not because we agree on the color of the pews or we agree on where we're located or some foolish junk. It's because of the name of Christ and who He is. That is the common foundation that we fellowship around. Now here's His answer. Well, I mean, you can perceive God in any way you want to. He's the grand architect of the universe. You know, you can see Him as you may have used. You, you understand that the Masonic Lodge goes much further than simply the Christian faith that it goes out into others and brings them in. And so uh, you, say, you, you say, give me an answer to that. What common thing brings you together as a Mason? That's a pretty tough question. Well, we want to do good works. Are you kidding? Well, it's about coming together as a bunch of good old boys and we sit around in the dark and we, you know, we say this and that and we, you know, we memorize things and flip the uh, pennies into the pot and whatever. What brings you together? Why are you here? What's your purpose? What's your foundation? What's your core? What are you about? That's a hard question. I gave you the answers to why I'm here today as a Christian. That's what I'm about. I'm about the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not about the brotherhood of man. I'm not about good works. Good works are fine, but that's not what it's about. What's it about? It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, it's about the propagation of the Baptist faith. Baptists can die, as far as I'm concerned, a thousand deaths if they deviate from Christ. Amen. No, no, no. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what it's about. That's where we are and who we are. And what makes us what up, what we are. All right, so I've talked about it. And next week we'll pick it up. And I'm going to try to get a hold of this thing by Gail Ripplinger. What she's going to do is carry it over from Blavatsky, if I understand you correctly. She'll carry it over from Le, uh, Blavatsky, Theosophist, and make a direct contemporary application of it and show you how that the dictionaries and these other sources of reference and all of that, you're seeing it today in the churches. And you are. Yes, sir. In uh, Great Britain and Canada, they're passing a wall where these Christian schools that are located in these countries have to teach paganism with equal enthusiasm as Christianity. And Yale University, or Yale or Harvard, I can't remember where, are on the 10th, that was yesterday, had a ceremony of, of a worship service for Satan on yeah, I saw that. As a yeah, I saw that. I saw that. I think it's Harvard, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure, though. Don't hold me to it. But it's one of them. It's Ivy League school. Yeah. 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 And it's going rampant in this country. Yeah. 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 And there's a new, a new book called The uh, Hand of God that's uh, churches are promoting it, but it's uh, very new age. Uh, Constance Cumby wrote a book. I've got it. She wrote it about 20, 25 years ago. She's an attorney. And it's a good book. It's called The, the Hidden Secrets of the Rainbow. And it was about the New Age Movement. Back then it was called the New Age Movement. Today it's called the Emerging Church. <laughs> we'll be preaching about that in a few minutes. Amen. Will you dismiss us, brother?